Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Westview Church Online. I'm John, this is my wife, Angie, and we're coming to you from Westview Church in Longview, Washington. We're really glad that you could join us today. Yes, we're hoping you join us today. Hope you're getting used to this whole virtual church. I think it's going to be short-lived, though, so we're looking forward to having you back here with us physically so that we can worship together. We sure are. And uh, we're going to start today by uh, opening up in prayer, asking for God's blessing uh, as we gather today in this way. So would you just join me in a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day. And Lord, as we are continuing to just uh, enjoy this side of the cross and the resurrection, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you give us hope. We thank you, Lord, that your life is in us as your people. And we ask God that we would just today express this new day, express our worship and our praise and our thanks to you as we sing, uh, as we uh, join together around your word in just a few moments, that God, your spirit would minister to us. Your spirit, Lord, would also minister to those that are joining us today that you would open our hearts and open our minds, open our, our ears and our understanding so that we might know what it is you are saying to us in these days, Lord. So thank you, God, for what you are going to do in our lives this day, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we uh, had a Zoom meeting the other night with the youth and we looked at Acts chapter 16. We talked about um, comparing the energy drink to something in the Bible, and that was praise and worship. Right. So that's what Paul and Silas were doing in the prison, and the earth shook because they were praising. So you guys might be feeling like you need a little bit of energy, you might be feeling kind of down, you might be feeling isolated. There's no better remedy than to praise and worship. So that's even though true. you're there and we're here, let's praise and worship the Lord together, okay? Because it is, it's time to praise the Lord. So let's do that today. I want to see you. I want to see you. 
It's amazing how when we worship, we can see the Lord. It changes the perspective on everything. Amen. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name. 
God, we thank you that we can always depend on that. God, that your word says that you work out all things for the good of those that love you and are called by your name. So God, we thank you that your goodness is always running after us. Lord, help us to remember that. Help our congregation to remember that. Help this community to remember that. That you want nothing but good for us. And we can trust you. So God, we thank you for that. We thank you that you're dependable. We thank you that we can trust you. We thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us, God. We thank you for giving us life. God, we thank you for this day, for our church, and for so many reasons to praise yes, you. Lord. God, we just ask for your anointing now on the rest of the service and on the message, God. I pray that your words would just go forth powerfully. God, that people would know and sense your touch, God, as we look to your word. So, God, we give you this day, we give you praise, all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Have we told you lately that we miss you? <laughs> I hope you know that. Uh, it's just you. not, life is not the same without you all. We miss the rest of our worship team. Yeah. We just, uh, we miss you all, and we're just counting the days even though we don't have an end date in sight we, we just are praying that it's really soon that we get to come back together and we just encourage you guys um let the first sunday that we are back together be full you guys just come back out to church don't get in the habit of not coming to church okay so we need you you need us it's the body of christ and we need to be together so we're looking forward to that so just as a few reminders um, we are planning on continuing the Zoom meetings with the youth on, on Wednesday nights at 7. And that's, uh, we, we send out a link and a password so it's secure. So we will have youth meeting uh, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock on Zoom. Um, board meeting and council meetings. Pastor John will be in touch with you. We'll probably send you all of the email information with the financials and all of that stuff. And then we'll be um, corresponding that way and discussing that. Other than that, we do want to continue to encourage you to give of your tithes and your offerings. God's work doesn't stop just because the church doors are physically closed. The church is still functioning. Um, people are still being reached, actually, maybe more than ever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we need you to continue to give, mm -hmm. and God blesses you for it. You know yeah. that. So um, remember, you can send your check to the, to the mailbox at 2335. 46th Avenue, Longview, Washington, 98632. Or you can go to our website, which is www.westviewchurchfamily.org. It's westviewchurchfamily.org. Go over to the More tab, click on that, go down to where it says Contact and Give, and then there will be a Donate button right there. So you can give that way, or you can also text to give, and that is the number 84321. 84321. Um, you press that and then put in the amount. It'll give you the link. You'll find our church and um, you'll get a receipt emailed to you. So there's three ways that you can give. Also, um, we want you to give of your time as well. There's a lot of people that um, maybe you are feeling isolated and it does wonders. I got a few phone calls this week and it does wonders to have somebody call. Mm -hmm. So take some time this week and give somebody a call and just encourage them, let them know you're thinking of them, let them know that you miss being part of the family of God and um, that we'll all be together soon. So give up your time and uh, just encourage somebody this week, right? Yes, absolutely. Right. And I, I wanna chime in here too, as far as the prayer is concerned. And thank you for letting us know what your needs are and for expressing your requests either through Facebook, uh, texting us, you've got our phone numbers. Um, if you have something that you specifically would like uh, either Pastor Angie or myself respond to you concerning, you can call us right at the church. And uh, our church phone number is 360-636-0370. That's the church number and we're checking for messages every day Again, the number is 360-636-0370. And if you would like to reach out to us by email, I'm going to give you my email address. It's pastorjohn at wstvw 
dot org. And I like the way Angie put it last week. It's just Westview without the vowels. <laughs> I like that. So Pastor John at Westview dot org. Well, we're just going to uh, spend some time in the Word. But before we do, I would like us to just join together once more for prayer. Uh, maybe you have a need right now, today. Maybe you're experiencing some, some emotions that you don't like. Uh, maybe there's some things that are going on in your life that, uh, like for so many of us right now, that you don't feel like you have any control over. That's not a good feeling, to feel like you're losing control. But again, th those times that we are, are hit hard by life's realities, or when there's sickness, or there's financial problems that we're dealing with, those are just opportunities to turn to God. And rather than look at them as obstacles, we can make them opportunities. So just as a point of contact, however you're viewing this service right now, whether it's your computer, uh, whether it's your mobile device, why don't you just touch that right now as a point of contact. And I'm just going to join hands here with Pastor Angie, and we're going to pray for you right now. Let's go to the Lord. God, I thank you for everyone that's watching today. I thank you for, first of all, for our own church family at Westview Church here in Longview. Lord, we thank you that God, as Angie said, you're not, we're not alone. You are with us. You're, you promised, Lord Jesus, that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. So God, help us in this time that we're feeling stretched. Maybe we're feeling a little cut off because we are from others in the family of faith. Lord, help us just to press in even harder to you and to take a little bit more extra effort maybe to pick up that phone and, and text a message and, or, or put a message out on Facebook uh, just to help us all feel more connected. And for those that are just are feeling at a loss as to what to do right now, God, give them peace. Give them direction and guidance from your Holy Spirit. We just thank you, God, that as Angie said, the church goes on. The church is not a building. Uh, it's not uh, schedules and programs. The church is people who you, Lord Jesus, have called out for yourself to be your very own. And so, God, thank you for reminding us of that in this time. And, Lord, we also, as a church, want to pray, uh, extend our prayers, Lord, to those in our community, those, Lord, that are suffering, those that are struggling, those that feel like they have no hope. We pray, Lord, that they will know that Jesus loves them and that, God, you have a purpose for their life. And that, Lord, sometimes it's when we have everything taken away that we really begin to see what really matters and what we really need to focus on in life. So, God, we just thank you for that. We're going to thank you for that because that's a merciful dealing of God. You're drawing people closer to yourself, showing them, Lord, that you love them and that you can be trusted for every single thing in their lives. And we pray more than anything that people all over our, our community, all over our state, all over our country and the world will have an awareness of their need for Christ. And that, Lord, they will turn from their sins and confess you as their Savior and Lord. Lord, we believe that you're sending your church a great awakening. Lord, a time where we are just beginning to refocus and shift our thoughts, our ideas, our, our, our priorities back on you, Lord, because you're coming again. And we pray, Lord, that you will just be honored in these days as you heal people that are sick from this disease. Lord, as you touch families, Lord, as you touch marriages, as you touch young people and as you touch adults, and, and especially our vulnerable seniors, Lord, that, God, you would be present in their lives and they would know your presence. They would know your love and your grace and your peace in this time. Now, Lord, open our hearts as we open your word. Holy Spirit, speak to us and help us, God, to, to just allow you to, to speak right where we are right now in this, in this moment and help us to apply the truths that we see from your word to our lives. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. Wow. Let's readjust here and yeah. we're going to uh, hold tight. Well, we're back live at Westview Church. Glad that you've joined us today. Thank you for singing with us. Thank you for praying with us. And now we're going to turn to the Word of God. And we're in John chapter 20, the Gospel of John chapter 20. And we're going to begin reading from verse 19. 
as we just celebrated the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are now on the other side, as it were, of his resurrection. And I want us today that as we read as we read this chapter, part of this chapter in John 20, I want us to do our very best to try to imagine that we are right there in that setting, in that scenario. And as we read through this, I think you'll begin to see why that's important. Because when we put ourselves in the scripture and we try to relate more closely to what's going on in the narrative of God's word, especially in the Gospels, then we, we better understand, we can better relate to Jesus, and we can better hear what he means and what he's saying to us personally. So we're not just looking back on an historical event, but this is when the Word of God comes alive and comes real in our lives. So would you read along with me? I'm reading from the New International Version of John chapter 20 and verses 19 to 31. Let's begin. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I pray the Holy Spirit will just really bless the word of the Lord to our lives today. The title of my message today is Reactions to the Resurrection. Reactions to the Resurrection. Now, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you have heard the name of C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis, in his book, A Grief Observed, said this, you never, know how much really you never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death. It is easy to say you believe a rope will be strong as long as you merely use it to tie something else. But suppose you had to hang by that rope over a precipice. Wouldn't you then first discover how much you really trusted it? So I'm going to ask you this morning as we begin, friends, do you believe? Do you believe? What do you need? What does it need to take for you to believe? Do you have faith in Jesus? Even though you haven't seen him, perhaps, do you still believe? Do you really trust in him? In chapter 20, we're, we come uh, 
we're, we're made aware of four reactions to the resurrection. And we're going to look at three of those today. The first one, of course, is in the early part of the 20th chapter when Mary Magdalene is the first to come to the tomb and she discovers that the stone has rolled away, that, that something strange has really taken place here. And she starts crying because she realizes that her master, Jesus, has, is no longer there and in the tomb where he was buried three days before. And she begins to cry. And then she hears a voice behind her, and the voice is asking her, Why are you crying? What is it, or who is it that you're looking for? And she thinks it's the gardener, right? You know the story. And, and she says, Someone has taken my Lord away. Please tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. Right away she recognized that voice. It was the voice of her Lord and Savior, Jesus. Now that's the first reaction that we find by anyone as recorded in the scripture to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so her reaction was she needed to hear in order to believe. And here she did. She heard the voice of the Lord. But these are the three other reactions that occur here in this 20th chapter to the resurrection of Christ. That seeing is believing. It took seeing Jesus again to believe that he, would, he was risen by the first ten apostles, the ten disciples that were first back in the room there, as we read earlier. And then doing the 11th disciple, who was not there the first time, when they were all locked together, all the disciples were locked together. It took Thomas, uh, he needed proof to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead. And then there's this element of trust. That's where we come in. Because we don't have physical, tangible evidence and proof. We have what the scriptures tell us. And of course, for those of us as believers in Christ, we have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. And what does God look for? What does He look for in you and me when it comes to faith, when it comes to believing? He wants us to trust Him. Well, let's look at the group that saw Him. Let's look at the disciples where seeing became believing for them. And we find this in verses 19 through 23. One of my favorite uh, teachers of the Word is Chuck Swindoll, and he said this about this scenario, and this narrative here in John chapter 20. This is how he described perhaps what it must have been like or could have been like for the disciples as, as they were there hunkered down in fear. Chuck Swindoll said, The room is dark. Only a flickering lamp dances with shadows upon the walls. The windows are shuttered and the door is barred and the disciples cower in the shadows. Their nails are bitten to the nub. Can you just kind of picture that in your mind? Jaws are clenched in anxiety. Heads are aching. Throats are parched. And tongues are clinging to their mouths. You see, the disciples were confined in a house. Does that sound familiar right now? It sounds really familiar. It seems like we're really getting to know our houses really well right now with this uh, lockdown, uh, with the outbreak of the virus. But for the disciples, it says the door was locked. They were there confined in fear that the Jewish leaders might discover them and haul them off, arrest them and have them put in prison. But you see, locked doors and confinement didn't give them any more peace. And that's true for us too. When we lock ourselves in and when we confine ourselves to fear, whether known or, or, or perceived, it just adds to our fear. It doesn't give us peace. The great thing, loved ones, is that locked doors can't keep Jesus the Savior out. It doesn't matter how confined you are. It doesn't matter how, how 
hunkered down we are and, and, and how much our schedules and our lifestyles have changed so dramatically, yes, Jesus can walk into our circumstances. Jesus can walk into our situation. And when he does, it changes everything. Jesus shows up and he gives his fearful disciples what they need the most. He gives them himself. Let me ask you today, friend, what do you need? What do you need in your life right now? Is it more things to fill your pantry? More toilet paper? Good luck finding some, by the way. Is it more food? Is it making sure you've got two full tanks of gas? Or making sure that you've got enough in your bank account to help sustain you for the unknowns that are in front of us in the future? No, Jesus just comes and he gives his disciples himself. And so many of us, especially for those of us like myself that are raised in the church, it's so easy to fall back on our belief or our religion, if you will. And the things that we become so accustomed to growing up or being in a church for a while, those things can become, if we're not careful, just crutches. Where we go through the motions and we go through the routine and at the end of the day, we have to look back and say, did I really encounter Jesus? Did I allow Jesus to come? Did, did, did I worship Him? Did I open up my life to Him? No matter what was going on in my life, did I just, as Angie said a few moments ago, did I just really intentionally praise and worship the Lord? I love what Jesus says when he shows up for the first time. Do you remember what he said? He said, peace be with you. A very, very common uh, Hebrew greeting, a Jewish greeting, even to this day. You, you would rec recognize it when you hear in our day, shalom. It means total peace, uh, peace and contentment, your total well-being coming into play. But this first time he says, peace be with you. Because remember, they're fearing. They're, they're scared out of their wits. They're scared out of their minds. Because they're trying to hide from the Jewish leaders. Because they had identified with Jesus as his followers. And they weren't quite too sure with Jesus now put in a, put in a tomb. Not, not believing that he had rose from the grave. Because they still hadn't seen him like Mary had, and a few of the others. But here they are, trying to do their best to keep what they had going, maintained, and sustained. And so Jesus recognizes this. He recognizes it when we are anxious and when we are fearful. He recognizes it, loved ones, when we're not trusting Him. When we're not, we're not believing His words. But we're caving into how we feel. And so this peace that he, he gives them, this peace that he bestows upon them, is a peace that's based upon his sacrifice for them and for us. It's the same peace that Paul referred to in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, where he said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have peace with God today? Is your peace based on how quiet you can make your house? Is your peace based on how, how euphoric you can make yourself feel? Is it all based on the absence of any noise whatsoever? Or is the peace that you have, does that come from the, from the knowledge and the assurance that you are born again, that you are saved, that you've been made right with God, justified by, by faith? And the peace that flows from that is a peace that the world cannot give. It's a peace that gives us that inner sense of well-being, that inner sense of confidence and hope that we are God's and we will be with God when it's time for us to go to eternity. And so with the Lord's words, peace be with you, there's this calm that I'm sure settled over their hearts. Oh, wow. Okay, he said, peace be with you, but anybody can say that. 
What does he do next? Well, he shows them his hands, right? And he shows them his side. And when they saw who it was, and they recognized that his hands were the hands that were pierced just days earlier on the, on the cross, and his side was showing the wound left from the spear that was thrust into his side, they saw and they were overjoyed, it says. You know, we all reach times in our life when life isn't joyful, when life is hard, when life becomes difficult. And Martin Luther, who uh, we all know uh, from history, the father of the Protestant uh, Reformation, when he was struggling and in a critical period in his spiritual life, his mentor and friend, Johann von Stoppitz, encouraged Luther, and this is what he said to Luther. Stoppitz said to Luther, look at the wounds of Jesus. Look at the wounds of Jesus. There is no other sign which can give us peace. There's no other sign that can give us rest and give us calm when we are locked up in fear. We need to look at the wounds of Jesus, friends. Isaiah said, Surely he took up our pain, and Jesus bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He, Jesus, was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53, 4-5. There's no other sign. There's no other way that we can have peace. I believe that's one reason why Jesus showed his disciples his wounds. Because he was showing them not just the marks and the signs of his death, but he was showing them what he went through to be the sacrifice for their sins, just as he shows to us. That's why it's important to look at his wounds. Let me ask you today, have you looked at the wounds of Jesus and believed that he took your place on the cross and gave you peace and forgiveness? Have you placed your trust in him? Is he your only hope for this life and for eternity? Look at his wounds, friend. For you and I, as we do believe and receive Him as Savior. Because when we do, we'll be overjoyed. And so He says the first time, peace be, be with you. But then a second time, He says, peace be with you. Now the first message of peace that Jesus gave them was when He showed them His wounds in verses 19 through 20. The second time in verse 21, His message came to them with His commission to them to go into the world and share the good news of Jesus. As the Father has sent me, right? He said, so I'm sending you, in verse 21. Do you see what he's saying? He says, see my hands, it's me. And then he says it a second time, see my hands and go. Everything's okay. I've come back to life, just as I said I would. And I am sending you now. I'm recommissioning you to go tell others about me. And so the first peace is peace with God based on the sacrifice of Jesus. That's why he showed his followers his hands and his side. Seeing was believing. But this second peace, when he says here in verse 21, peace be with you, it's the peace of God. First of all, we have peace with God. And we become, we become his children. We're saved, we're forgiven, and we're brought into a relationship with him. That's, that's having peace with God. You've often heard maybe uh, at, a, at another church or have heard the expression, have you made your peace with God? That's that first peace. But now the second peace is the peace of God. That comes from his presence with us. Jesus sent these disciples to take his place 
as the Father's ambassadors into the world. And friend, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, do you know that you are sent by Jesus to tell others about his love, about his peace and forgiveness? I've often thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if somehow uh, Jesus had come up with another way to get his good news out to the world? I mean, why, why, why couldn't it happen that we could just pay for a big billboard ad and say, you know, you need Jesus and here's how you come to him? Or if just maybe by osmosis people uh, just kind of fall, you know, stumbled upon God and, fall, and stumbled upon the truth. That, that God loved them and that he sent his only son for their sins, took his place for our sins, and that, that he was the only way to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Wouldn't it have been a whole lot easier for God to, to just have people find him that way? And yet, what does God do? He, he asks people like you and me, imperfect with our weaknesses and with our failures and our brokenness. Mm -hmm. He asks us to take this message of his love and his grace and his peace to others. His message of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Okay, as the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you. Okay, I'm his follower and I see that he's sending me just as he sent these disciples. Well, there's, there's something very interesting that that we find as, as believers, we find that we don't just go out there without any preparation. We don't go out there uh, trying to tell others about Jesus and making him known and real to others uh, all on our own. We have been given some, uh, some equipment and we find that equipment in Ephesians chapter 6 where the Apostle Paul teaches us about the armor of God. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm in your faith. And do you know one of the things that we put on after, uh, while we're putting on all the different pieces of our armor, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, taking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and so on, he says this, very interesting. He says, and fit your uh, feet with the readiness or the preparation that comes from the gospel of peace. Isn't that interesting? It can be implied then that we're going to have to be going somewhere to take this message of Jesus. But we need to prepare ourselves with the right shoes. We need to prepare ourselves uh, with the right strategy. We need to prepare ourselves and be thinking Christians and intentional Christians about taking the message of Jesus to others. Of recognizing that Jesus has sent us. As the Father sent Jesus, Jesus sends us. And he gives us the every ability to take this message of good news to others. I've been thinking a lot about this time of confinement that I've been in, that Angie's been in, that you're in right now. We don't have the same freedoms. We just can't move around and go places and be with our family and friends as much as we would like to. But during this time of confinement, I believe that we should be preparing ourselves for our commission. Jesus is sending us to people who desperately need his peace. And if there's anything that has, that has really revealed the need that people have for Jesus, it's the crisis we are in in this world right this moment. People are doing all sorts of crazy things to try to make sense of what's going on. People are, are just, they're just distressed like never before. It shouldn't surprise us from a biblically prophetic standpoint. It says in the last days, there'll be great stress upon all people. Men's hearts will fail them for fear. But we don't have a message of fear. We have a message of love, of God's grace, of God's forgiveness. A message that we know the Lord and we invite others to come to know Jesus and follow him as well. Now, how do we do this? Well, we, yeah, we need to have armor, but we also have to have an authority. We have to have a commission and a reason to be commissioned, and that's because of what Jesus said. He said, as the Father sends me, now I'm sending you. You can just see this delegation going here. 
You can see how it's this transfer of authority is being passed from the Father to Jesus, to Jesus to us. From Jesus to us. It's by our Father's authority, in verse 21, that we are sent. That we have a purpose, that we have a commission as Christians to share the good news of the gospel with Jesus. And what power are we sent? What ability do we have? Well, Jesus says we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad that in my power, that it's not up to me, it's not up to my power or my ability to share Jesus with others. It's, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that enables me and enables you, if you're a believer, to take this message of hope to others. Now, during this time of sheltering, of being sheltered in place and social distancing and the slower pace that I'm experiencing in my life, you know, it's caused me to clarify my own priorities. It seems like the Lord has been impressing upon me to simplify my life. And to simplify what it really means to minister. What it really means to be sent by the Lord to others. And to focus on what really is most important right now. That the most important thing for us... Now be careful how, how you take this. Because what I'm about to say isn't wrong. It's just getting our priorities in the right order. This time for us as people of God. This time for us as followers of Jesus Christ. Who have been sent by the Lord into our world, into our neighborhood, into our community, with the good news of Christ. It's not about stocking up our pantries. It's not about stocking up our toilet paper. Those things are important. But our priority is on being sent by Jesus to more effectively bring his message of forgiveness and peace to other people. You say, well, you know, sharing the Gospels for pastors. You're probably looking at me right now and said, well, uh, John, you were born with the gift of gab, so I'll just leave that up to you. I'm not a talker. Sorry, you, that, you're not going to get off the hook that easily. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, it says, quoting, the, quoting Isaiah, it said, how shall they hear unless someone preaches to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? And the Lord says that blessed are the feet of those who bring good news to others. That's all of us. That's all of us. And it's during this time that I think the Lord is causing me and perhaps... He's impressing upon you as well to get ready. To not just be dawdling away and wasting time, but to make well use of this time that we may never have another opportunity like this to really gear up and to really pray up and to really read up in God's Word and really armor up. Because this is not going to be our last crisis before Jesus comes. There's going to be more crisis. The Bible says in the last days, things will get worse and worse. In fact, the virus that we are experiencing today was prophesied 2,000 years ago by Jesus, where it says that there will be wars, rumors of war, and there will be pestilences. And I looked up that word pestilence in the dictionary, and it literally means a plague. It means a virus. But you know what? Even if a vaccination was found today and people were given a vaccination against the coronavirus, people would still be infected by sin and lost without Christ. Are you listening to me? As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. You, 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 me, Angie, 
That's why we are here, friends. It's to be Jesus to others. It's to walk like Jesus. It's to act like Jesus. It's to talk like Jesus. So when they see us, seeing will be believing. We are the body of Christ. We are His hands, His feet, His arms, His legs. That's the joy of being a Christian is being a representative of Jesus Christ. And he gives us everything we need to take this gospel and share it with others. He gives us the power of the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus breathed on them in verse 22, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit, it just made me think of Adam when God in creation formed Adam from the dust of the earth. And you can read this later in Genesis where it says that God breathed on him and he became a living soul. God gives breath. He gives life. He gives spiritual life. He gives physical life. And I believe that what Jesus was doing was getting them conditioned, getting them ready for an, an, in anticipation of the day of Pentecost when they would be fully empowered by the Holy Spirit 50 days later. And so God was getting them ready for their destiny. God, God was getting them ready to take this good news to their generation, to take the good news of Jesus to others. And then he says something else very interesting in verse 23. He talks about forgiveness. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now this is one Bible verse that has been really misinterpreted and misunderstood and quite often actually ignored. But forgiveness, friends, is the core of the good news of the gospel. It's the core of the good news of Jesus. It's the very central truth of the Bible is forgiveness. And the church, you and me, are called to be sent to the world. The church, you and me, are now given authority to declare that our sins and other people's sins are forgiven or they're retained. Now, don't turn me off yet and say that I've just joined the Catholic Church because that is not what I'm saying. What we have been commissioned to do is to proclaim the forgiveness of sins just as the apostles, the first Christians did in the first century in the book of Acts. That was one of the continuing themes throughout the book of Acts. Was the message that Jesus proclaimed. Repent, turn away from your sins, and you will be forgiven, and you will be saved. You see, what this means is Jesus was giving the apostles and the church, you and me, the privilege of announcing how a person can receive forgiveness. If a person believes in Jesus, then a Christian has the right to announce that person's forgiveness. But if a person rejects Jesus, then a Christian can announce that person is not forgiven. It's not up to a person to, des to decide if someone is accepted or forgiven by God. It's based on their confession of faith. And by the way, there is no instance in the New Testament of an apostle forgiving sins. So I, I may get into trouble with any one of you friends that come from a Catholic background, uh, but we're just, uh, we're just basing everything that we possibly can on the Word of God and the precedent given in the Word of God. Now, one of the things I wanted to share with you something here, because this is part of what Jesus taught his disciples. He taught them that they have the keys to the kingdom. And this is one of the keys that God has given every believer, that Jesus has given every one of his followers. And it's the key of, of ministering forgiveness and helping people to find forgiveness in Christ and identifying those people that have, but also identifying people that have rejected Christ. Now, when I was growing up, I thought one of the coolest things would, was, was I'd, I'd see these, these older men uh, walking around in stores, out on the street, with this big ring of keys hanging off their belt. Do you ever remember seeing that, those of you that are maybe uh, 50 or older? Uh, and I brought my keys with me. I, the, these keys, you know, I, I always thought, man, that would be so cool 
if I had a big ring of keys. There was a job that I had that I had probably 25 keys on my key ring. And I just got to the point where I got so tired of those keys, I didn't want to see another key in my life. But I do my very best to reduce the amount of keys I carry. And I just carry the ones that are the most essential. And I just want to put a, uh, also just suggest to you that if uh, you ever lock yourself out of your house, make sure you got a spare key in your wallet or your purse or maybe hidden somewhere. Those are the essential keys that we're talking about. And I've got a key for my cars. I've got a key for some padlocks. I've got a key, of course, to the house. I've got a key to the church. I've got a key to the garden shed. I think those are pretty essential keys. Well, Jesus has given us some essential keys. And he's put these keys into the hands of all believers. They're the keys of the kingdom. Do you know that every single person that we come in contact with, I believe that God will give us the key to help them understand and help them know who Jesus is. He'll show us. He'll open the way for us, in a sense, open that door with the key that he's given us to help them find Christ and come to salvation. And so seeing is believing. The second thing that we see from this passage is that proving is believing. And this is especially true with the disciple Thomas. Thomas was one of those people that was just a naturally born skeptic. He needed proof that Jesus was alive. It wasn't good enough for, for Thomas to just hear it from somebody else that Jesus had risen. He needed to see the Lord himself. And that's why he says here, unless I touch his, his wounds, unless I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. But, and so we're given a window into his life. He's often been called Doubting Thomas, exactly. And so we see Thomas here uh, kind of holding to this theory that a lot of people hold in their lives, that they just rely completely on observation and experiment that they base what they are going to believe on their sense experience. And they rely on that solely before they form their own belief, whether something is true or whether something is false. It's kind of a scientific approach to life. It's an approach that many people have today. It's the Thomas approach, we can call it. You know, I will not believe in God unless I see him and feel him for myself. Show me proof. Present me with evidence and I will believe in him. And maybe today, like Thomas, you're at a place where you will not believe unless Jesus and his claims can pass your battery of scientific tests. Well, in reality, my friend, believe it or not, you actually do believe in things you can't see all the time. Have you ever turned a light switch on? Yeah. You believe electricity is flowing as current through your house. Why do you believe that? Because you turn a light on, believing that that electricity is going to power the lights and you'll be able to see in your home. You and I can't see the virus, or any germ for that matter, with the naked eye. But we believe it exists. We see the evidence of that everywhere. And that's why we take steps to wear masks and wash our hands and do social distancing. You believe in what you can't see because someone told you about those realities when you were probably very young. The same is true for spiritual things. What I'm doing today, my friend, is I'm just simply telling you that what the Bible says is true because I have personally experienced Jesus for myself. By faith, I have trusted Him as my Savior and my Lord. By faith, I believe His Word is true. By faith and personal experience, I know that my Redeemer lives and that He lives in my heart. I have a peace that my sins are forgiven and that God loves me and accepts me as His own. Can you imagine the anguish and the struggle that Thomas must have had during that week after Jesus had risen from the dead. Can you just imagine the stuff that he was dealing with, going through? I mean, he was having a hard enough time hanging out with the other ten apostles. They were all just, you know, glomming together for mutual support. And he needed to get away, it's pretty obvious. 
Maybe he had to go visit his twin brother, because that's what Thomas means, or Didymus. It means twin. And so maybe he had to go hang out with his twin brother and seek some uh, comfort and some solace there. But regardless of what was going on in his life, he was torn between hope and fear. Even after seeing the joy and the peace uh, on the faces of the other ten disciples. Look how compassionately Jesus deals with our doubts and our unbelief as we take a moment just to look at Thomas. Jesus met Thomas where he was at. Isn't that what the Lord does with you and me? Doesn't he come down to where we are and reveal himself to us? I love the Lord for that, don't you? Here we see Jesus was completely set on winning Thomas back. And he was willing to do what Thomas was asking. Here, here was God himself in human form acquiescing to a man's request. His specific request that Jesus reveal the parts of his body that were wounded, that were pierced at his crucifixion. I love it how Jesus didn't reprimand Thomas. You know, hey Thomas, get more spiritual, would you? No, he just, he just reached out to him. And he invited Thomas to touch him and to see him for myself. And what was Thomas's reaction to the resurrection, to the resurrected Christ? My Lord and my God. And that was all the proof he needed. And so for Thomas, seeing and proving was believing, but the greater blessing was for those who had not seen, and they still believed. The writer in Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. You can't please God aside from faith, aside, for take, aside from taking Him at what He says in His Word. It's impossible to please God. You can't do it by good works. You can't do it by going to church every Sunday or online church every Sunday, if the case may be. You can't please God by doing good things all the time for your neighbor, all those, those things are important. The only way that God is pleased is when we put our trust and our belief and our faith in Him completely. That's what pleases God. And that's what positions us to receive all the blessings that God has for us. Without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to God must believe that He is God and that He's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek Him. Hebrews 11.6 So number one, seeing is believing. Number two, proving is believing. And now number three, we close with this, trusting is believing. Trusting is believing. And that's found in verses 29 through 31. Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen. Blessed are those who believe, even in the pitch black when there's no stars shining. Trusting when the sun hasn't shined, hasn't shined for days. Blessed when things we have we have depended upon or taken away like we're experiencing right now in this, this crisis. Blessed when we are confined and distant from our family and friends. Blessed when our jobs and our income are lost. Blessed when the future is not looking bright from a human standpoint. To still believe in the middle of all that is when you and I are really trusting Jesus. He's the one who secured our salvation because of His perfect sacrifice for our sins on the cross. And who overcame death and hell and sin and the grave to give us the hope of eternal life forever and abundant life now. That's the blessing we have by trusting, by believing what we cannot see. The things that Jesus did were written in this book so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, the one sent from God, and that by believing you may have life in His name.
it says in verse 31. So I'm, going, I'm telling you today that if you don't know this resurrected Lord, if He is not real in your life, I'm telling you, my friend, that you can trust Him by simply believing. He comes to you not to condemn you, but He comes with His love to save you. He comes right to where you are today, speaking peace. He comes to you offering forgiveness and hope. Jesus comes to right where you are with your doubts and your unbelief. And He's inviting you to come to Him. To believe He came to give you life in His name. I'm telling you, you can trust Him. There's an incredible blessing that's waiting for you when you believe without seeing when you believe without proving, but by simply trusting Him. Just believe. That's the best reaction you could ever have to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. And I challenge you to see for yourself. If you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus, would you bow your head with me now? And I want to lead you in a simple prayer. Just pray this prayer in your heart to the Lord or out loud. Say, Dear God, I come to you now. I thank you for your sacrifice on the cross for my sin. That the blood that you shed, the life that you gave was for me so that I wouldn't have to pay the penalty and the punishment for my sin. You took my punishment. You were wounded for my transgressions. You were bruised for my wrongdoing, my iniquities. The punishment of my peace was upon you, and, and the Lord laid on you, Jesus, all of our iniquities. Thank you for taking my place, but thank you, Lord, that you didn't just die on the cross. You rose again on the third day, and you appeared again and again to your people, to your followers, some of which we just read about here in John chapter 20. And Lord, I may not see you physically and tangibly. I'm kind of maybe a little like Thomas, who needs more proof. But Lord, I know more than anything that I, I know what I need. And what I've been trying to fill my life isn't working. What I've been trying to do to bring myself peace and to bring myself contentment isn't working. And so I release me, myself to you. Come into my life, Lord. I receive you now as my Savior. I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new person from the inside out. I want to be your follower. I want you to use me to tell others about you and the joy and the peace and the love that I have that you've given me. Lord, I want to trust more than I ever have before. And this, this is for all of us now. Help me to trust you, even when it's hard. Help me to see you by faith, based on what your word says, and based upon that inner witness of your Holy Spirit, making Jesus real to me through your word. I don't have to look any further. You've given me everything I need to know you, to grow in you, and to experience your joy and your love. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you, God, that you've given me the hope of heaven because you rose from the dead and I have that same hope that I will spend eternity with you because you overcame death, you overcame the grave, and I don't have to fear the future because I'm yours. And so, Lord, thank you for this time together. We pray that, God, your word will just become a living, breathing, vital force in our lives especially in these days when we're so closed in and we've had so many changes to our lives. Help us to use this time to draw closer to you, to get ready for the next event, Lord, that, that you have for us to participate together in the sharing the good news with our neighbors, with our community, 
And Lord, through our missionaries that we support around the world. Thank you, God, for this time together. Bless each one who has heard and who is responding now to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. It's been a delight to come to you again and share these songs and share uh, the word of God with you. We look forward to connecting with you soon. God bless you. Have a good week.